Hello, everybody. This is the Cincinnati Herald podcast. I'm your host, John Alexander Reese, digital editor of the Cincinnati Herald. And if you don't know, the Cincinnati Herald has been around since 1955, and it is the largest African American newspaper in the greater Cincinnati area. And we have some guests with us today. First of all, we have Tyra Gordon, uh, a writer for the Cincinnati Herald. How you doing, Tyra? Hi, John. I'm doing well. How are you? I am doing fantastic. Next, we have Andrea Carter, our media consultant. How are you today, Andrea? Fine. Thank you, John. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. And finally, we have our intern, Zoe Becker. How are you doing, Zoe? Hi, I'm great. How are you? I'm doing good. And this is the first time we've had you on our show. So just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so um, I'm a senior at Miami University in Ohio. I'm studying journalism and sociology, and I'm currently living here in uh, right outside of DC, and I'm working remote for the Herald for January, so. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, so let's dive right into our main stories of the week. And our first story, and it's something we were hinting at in our last podcast is about the second impeachment of Donald Trump. Donald Trump has certainly made history as he is the first U.S. president to be impeached twice by the House of Representatives. So, um, Andrea, um, what are your thoughts on this? It's an interesting story because he, I, I think it's ironic, he was impeached one year ago by the House of Representatives because of the Russian scandal. And now, one year later, even though there are a couple of senators who said, oh, don't worry, he's learned his lesson, he won't do it again. One year later, we're right back where we started again because he didn't learn his lesson. Um, Donald Trump has never been reprimanded. Everyone has always told him yes, they've never told him no. And even when they've told him no, he found a way around it that benefit him. But this time, he found out he's bit off more than he can chew and he the ramifications of this have are just getting started he he doesn't know yet what is going to you know what's going to come down the pike this is bigger than he even anticipated yes definitely tyra what are your thoughts on donald trump's second impeachment just to kind of piggyback off of what andrea said in terms of ramifications he should have been held accountable um, and he should have been impeached the first time. Um, so I feel like this was a long time coming. He does need to be held accountable for the things that he's done. And even though he will no longer be in office, I think it's important to impeach him to take away the rights that he would hold as a former president. So taking away the security, the secret service detail, all of the benefits that come with being a former president, I think that needs to happen. Um, to teach him a lesson. Yes, definitely. And Zoe, as the youngest person here, um, what are your thoughts on seeing a U.S. president getting impeached twice? It's like, it's crazy. It's like, what are your thoughts on this? It really is crazy. Um, four years ago, when he was elected, I was just going into college. And now, four years later, he's being um, he's being impeached for a second time right after the same time last year, which is crazy. But I think one of the biggest differences in between this year and last year is that all of his supporters are, you're, we're not hearing from them as much because his website, his Twitter has been silenced. His fans that used to speak out on Parler are now not able to have that communication with him anymore. Um, but as a young person, it's definitely... Um, I, I think that he should be impeached because I think that, as Andrea and Tyra said, um, he definitely needs to have those ramifications. And um, yeah. Now let's move on to our next topic. And our next topic is about outrage and more despair as prosecutors fail to charge officers in the case of Jacob Blake. On August 23rd, Jacob S. Blake, a 29-year-old black man, was shot and seriously injured by police officer uh, Rustin Seski in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Seski shot at uh, Blake's back seven times when Blake opened the driver's door to an SUV and leaned in. 
three of Blake's sons were in the back seat at the time. And he is paralyzed from the waist down because of this encounter. The officers who shot Blake will not be charged at all. And I know, and we've seen this happen so many times with the shooting of black men. It seems like the officers always shoot first, ask questions later, and the officers are never reprimanded. Rarely are they even fired. Um, so it's unfortunate to see this happen again. Um, Tyra, what are your thoughts on the officers who shot Jacob Blake not being uh, reprimanded and facing criminal charges? John, it's unfortunate. And like you mentioned, is a story that we've seen um, countless times. And I think the more that it happens and the more that police officers get off, the more it will continue to happen because they see that they are not going to face any consequences. I feel as if in situations where, you know, a suspect may have been apprehended and they may have, you know, been pulled over or done something wrong, police officers are trained to disable um, and they know how to disable without killing and, and they're not doing that. But in Jacob Blake's case, um, he was there, he was trying to um, stop a, a dispute. Um, he was going to his vehicle um, with his kids in his vehicle and he was shot seven times and it's it's a shame, it's pointless. and Unfortunately, um, I, I feel like the laws of this land weren't, they weren't made to protect us. Um, and there have been amendments that have um, been put in place, you know, in later years to give us certain rights, but I just feel like the laws were never meant to protect us. And unfortunately, I think that's been embedded in the minds of, of people and that's what we see today. Andrea, what are your thoughts on this situation? Um, I think it's unfortunate that we continue to see this situation unfold, as Tyra said, over and over again. But I think it's more than just a failure of um, people recognizing in the intent of what went down during the situation. I think it's a failure of um, education on the part of society helping people recognize the difference between good actions and bad actions, and also better training on bias. Um, we've seen enough examples of what happens when um, people of color are involved in an incident and people of non-color are involved in an incident. What's the difference? People of non-color walk away more than people of color. Um, as a person who has covered police departments, I have a huge respect for the job for first responders. But at the same time, I also recognize that despite all the good men and women who do serve in the police department, there are bad apples who, we, who see certain things first and not, not what they're responding to second. And I think that's a fault on the training, that they do not train these people better to sort of help erase these biases in their filtering system of when assessing a situation and um, have better reaction to it. Um, but then again, you can't change how a person grows up and sees things, no matter how much training you see. But the more training you have, the better it impacts or limits their reaction to it. Um, and I think it's unfortunate. I mean, really, truly, the police officer should have been charged, you know, because the man, Jacob Blake, told the officers that he was done he was walking to his cars. He needed to get his kids. He did not have to respond to anything else that police officer said. That police officer who has a form of control wanted to control the situation and control Blake and decided that when Blake defied his orders, he reacted, which you see in a number of police officers. They don't like their authority threatened or taken away. And that was the intent of the situation. True. But again, all police officers are not bad, but those who can't overcome certain situations, this is what happens the result of it. Mm, definitely. Um, and Zoe, um, what are your thoughts on this uh, very unfortunate situation? Um, I think, I mean, it's absolutely disturbing that he can still walk as a free man and, you know, thousands are locked up for life for lesser crimes that aren't weren't as violent 
Um, and I definitely agree with Andrea that education is a huge part um, so that other people can understand what happens in these processes and in these situations and, and why this happens. Um, and I also agree that bias training is incredibly important. I mean, white people are socialized from an early age to simply look at the world differently. And so many white people simply don't um, understand this at all. And they think that because they're not racist, that means that they don't have biases, but that's not true because everybody has a bias. Society has a bias. Every aspect of society has a bias. And I think bias training is something that all police forces, um, like they are required to do, but I think that it definitely should be considered the most important aspect of police training because that's where that's a fundamental issue that needs to be addressed in every single police officer, I think, because while there are definitely bad apples, I think that every person has bias and some people choose to address it differently than others. Agreed. Hey, John, I, yes. I, I agree with Zoe on the bias training. I went through bias training last year mm -hmm. um, as part of my job with the Urban League. And even I was found to have a few things. And I was like, it's unbelievable the difference of choosing, of you know, assessing a situation. And um, the people who ran the training, they said you have to think of the filters uh, that you live your life through, how you grew up, how you judge things, how you assume certain things go on. And I'm not saying everyone, um, education is the key in all of this. I mean, when it comes down to it, Cincinnati is lucky that we have not seen these incidents yet. We've seen them outside of the city, but not in the city. I think the collaborative has helped us to lessen these incidents here. Um, but I would say that the way the FOP is going is championing changes that we could see a, um, a ramp up of it happening. But I think for now, because of the collaborative, we have a different police force than we did when Timothy Thomas was alive. But again, that evolution has to continue and fine tune what they learned through the collaborative to continue that education, even though there's now pushback. Agreed, agreed, very good. And um, so for some lighter news, <laughs> recently, Colleen M. Hannock is the first woman to be president of Xavier University. According to the article, effective July 1st, 2021, Colleen will serve as the 35th president of Xavier University, succeeding Father Michael J. Graham. And I found this to be very interesting because, you know, I did graduate from Xavier but I really didn't have any idea that this was the first woman president of Xavier. And also the fact that Xavier didn't begin to fully let in women until 1969. I mean, earlier women were allowed to go to classes on weekends and weeknights and stuff, but it wasn't until 1969 that they actually let women into the regular college program. So I found that to be interesting. And I think that takes leaps and bounds as far as um, women in education and everything. Um, Zoe, as someone who's in college right now, uh, what are your thoughts about this? I think it's wonderful that she's the first woman, but you know, it, I agree with you. It's very surprising that in 35 presidents, she's the first woman. Um, but I think that it's great because one issue that is affecting colleges around the nation right now is um, that colleges aren't reporting their sexual assaults um, to the correct department. So I think that a woman in this leadership position can hopefully um, help uh, the culture of rape, the cu rape culture in colleges around the nation and sexual assault. Um, yeah, I, I wish my college had a woman president. I think that it's, I think that it's great and um, can be very helpful to students. Andrea, your thoughts on this um, story? Um, as a Catholic, I am not surprised that she's the first. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Catholic Church is very, um, oh, what is the word? Um, patriarchal. Patri mm -hmm. I'm not saying it right. Um, but it's a very, it, it's, you know, it's all men. Men lead. Um, it, 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 
I mean, nuns have been fighting for years to become priests, and they're not allowed. Um, the most that they can do is maybe become help with the altar and maybe um, hand out communion, but they're not even allowed to become deacons. Um, the, the Catholic Church has a long way to go, even though they've made inroads, but I'm not surprised. Um, but I think it's awesome that she's going to be taking over Xavier University. I think it's going to be um, a new attitude for the university. I think she's going to be very effective um, in updating the attitudes of the teaching facility and the students on leadership, on um, um, on what to expect of a person in a leadership position, especially a woman, because we have seen so many women succeeding now. In it, it's important for Cincinnati to have more women leaders to be seen in powerful roles that can affect change, not just on the campus, but within Cincinnati itself. So I applaud her and I can't wait to meet her. Good. Tyra, your thoughts on this news story? Well, Don, I think it's inspiring. Um, just, just like you said on a lighter news note, I'm not of the Catholic faith um, and I did not attend Xavier, just growing up in the tri-state area, not familiar with Xavier University. Um, but it was just interesting just to hear what you all said in terms of her being um, the first woman and it also says she's the first lay so non-clergy um, person to be president. So I just think it's inspiring, especially, you know, coming off the heels of Kamala Harris um, being the first woman and minority woman to be elected um, vice president. I think it's inspiring. So it'll be interesting to see what unfolds. Yes, indeed. And finally, our last news story of the week, and this is also another good story. <laughs> the Boston Red Sox hired Bianca Smith as the first black woman coach in baseball history. And that is quite the landmark story. Tyra, what are your thoughts on this magnificent story? John, it was a feel good story. I read it and it's inspiring. Um, however, just not to be a Debbie Downer, I read uh, the article in terms of, you know, how racist, historically racist Boston is in terms of sporting. So to see her as the, you know, first black um, woman to be hired in professional baseball, it's, it's inspiring, but I feel like it was a political move um, mm -hmm. on, you know, the part of the Boston Red Sox franchise um, because of the history, um, just reading, you know, the things that they've, um, been in trouble for in terms of racial slurs in Fenway Park. Um, so it's inspiring. And, you know, I hope she gets in that position and, you know, shows up and shows off. Um, but, you know, I see it as a political move. Mm, I see. Andrea, your thoughts on this story? Um, I thought it was inspiring. Um, I understand where Tyre's coming from. Um, Boston is, Boston fans are hardcore. You know, they, they don't like change. They don't like, they, they're known to their history regarding racial issue is um, apparent of what they do and don't like. But I think that being said, um, with this wind of change that we have been experiencing lately, um, I think Boston Red Sox read the tea leaves and saw that they need to, you know, take a step into the future and see how they can inspire future players um, because there's not a lot of black people playing baseball. Mm. Um, and I think it's an inspiring, inspiring way of getting girls to play softball again, getting boys to play baseball again. Um, I think, you know, even though it's a farm team, it's still a team of the Boston Red Sox. I think um, um, it's something that we can point to and say, hey, okay, you know, we'll see how she works out and keep going. There was a TV show about the first black female pitcher that only lasted one season, but it was a very good show. Um, you know, and, and unfortunately it, it broke a barrier that a lot of people are not willing to accept yet, but you know what? Women in baseball, we, we are dynamos and I applaud it. Agreed. Uh, and finally, Zoe, what are your thoughts on this new story? Um, sports is so gendered. I find I think it's fantastic that a woman can 
rise the ranks in a male dominated field such as sports but I think it's even more inspiring that it's a black woman I completely agree with Andrea that I think it could definitely open a door for um, future generations to aspire to play baseball and get involved in the field so I think it's great and I hope I hope that we hear more about it I hope that this isn't the only news about it and that we can um, keep following her um, because I think it will be I think it will be tough but um, yeah I'm very I, I think it's great fantastic well that's a, just about all the time we have today thank you everyone for coming on this podcast and I just want everyone to remember that if you want to check out these stories and all the other stories we have, you can check us out at www.thecincinnatiherald.com. And you can also get our paper from select stores, which includes Walgreens, UDFs, Joseph Beth Booksellers, and also select service stations. And I also want to remind everyone that this is MLK Weekend. So there are a ton of events going on in the city of Cincinnati. Now, some of them are obviously virtual because of the pandemic, but you should still definitely check them out. Make sure you check all of our social media for links to the events and everything. And also make sure to check out our social media for the inauguration post show that we are going to do. The inauguration is on Wednesday and we are going to talk about it. Just make sure to keep your eye on our social media pages for more information about that. And as far as social media goes, we're on all the major channels. So on Facebook, you can find us at the Cincinnati Herald. On Twitter, you can find us at Cincy Herald. You can also find us at Cincy Herald on Instagram. And also we're on YouTube too. Just search up the Herald TV and we post exclusive videos on there also. I want to thank Tyra, Andrea, and Zoe for being on the show today. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Yeah, thank you. All right. So that wraps up this episode. I'm John Alexander Reese, digital editor of the Cincinnati Herald. And everyone, have a fantastic evening. Mm -hmm.